Hello everyone, Hyper here, and welcome to the Big Dumb Strats Guide for Mythic Vexiona. This encounter is fairly easy, and most consider it easier than Mythic Xanash, so if you've defeated that, this boss shouldn't be that big of an issue. Now, if you'd like to read my Wowhead written guide, you can find the link to it in the description box. The written guide is basically the same as the video guide, but it's a great source to reference any information I talk about, and if you need to find a bullet point very quickly, you don't need to scroll through the video to find the topic. First of all, the mythic changes on this fight are not very significant. The big change is that Void Corruption stacks that you gain in Phase 1 will persist all the way to the end of the fight, so you can't just randomly walk into puddles to gain stacks. The second change is the introduction of the Iron Wield Enforcers. On most of the ad waves, you will get at least one of these, and they will cast Brutal Smash, which is about an 8-yard AoE that does one-shot. And they will also periodically grip in the two furthest targets, so you kind of need to play around this a little bit, because if people with Encroaching Shadows get gripped into melee and drop their puddles on melee, that can cause some problems down the line. Phase 1 is all about managing encroaching shadows, where you drop the puddles and maximizing your room that you have available for phase 2. So on pull you want to start the fight kind of towards the east side of the room, and then as you fill up the room with encroaching shadows, you gradually want to move towards the west. Players who are affected by encroaching shadows should drop their debuff near a wall, and then just stack the puddles right next to each other. Be very careful not to step into a puddle that already exists because like I mentioned earlier, the shadowy residue debuff that you get from standing in a puddle does persist throughout the entire fight, so you want to limit how many of these you actually get. One quick tip I can give you regarding the enforcer and encroaching shadows is to have a few players play kind of far away from the boss. Typically you have either mages or BM hunters do this because they can just blink out or in the case of BM Hunters, they can do their entire damage without having to stand still and cast. And this will prevent players with Encroaching Shadows being gripped back to the boss when they're trying to drop their debuff. Alternatively, another thing you can do is always try to tank the Enforcers close to the side of the room which has the puddles. So this means that the players with Encroaching Shadows who are dropping off their debuffs will be closer targets to this Enforcer and won't be getting gripped. The other important mechanic in this phase is the Void Portal, which will summon as occasionally throughout the phase. In the first phase one, you will get two waves, and these will most likely be cleaved down by the Annihilation cast by the Void Ascendant, and your second and third tank should be dealing with this. Your raid just needs to be very sure not to position between the Void Ascendant and the ads that spawn from the portal. The portal can spawn anywhere in the room that is within a given range of the boss. So you might have a situation where the portal spawns behind the ranged clump. And if that happens, your ranged DPS need to be very aware and move out of the way because they're about to get beamed. The tank doesn't usually care where players are standing. They will always just aim the beam at the adds. And it's your job to move out of the way of that beam, not the tank's job to avoid hitting you with it. The second wave of adds will spawn shortly before the intermission, and this wave actually needs to be DPS down, because at this point the Void Ascendant should be dead, and the boss should be flying up for the intermission phase, so there's nothing else to hit. Typically moving into the intermission phase, we decide which lane to go to first, depending on where the portal spawned right before the intermission. For example, if we had a top portal spawn, which is the area furthest away from the entrance of the room, um, then the whole raid would move to the top of the room. If we had a middle portal, then you can go either way. And then if we have a bottom portal, which is the area closest to the entrance of the room, then all of the people in the raid would bait to the bottom lane first. So in the intermission, it's important that you have kind of a set baiting pattern for the breath whenever the boss comes by. We tend to start in either top or bottom and then just alternate between those two lanes. And you do this because you want to end up with the last breath either in the top or bottom lane. So then you can move to the middle and have the boss come down and instantly be able to DPS her. 
if you bait it in the middle at any point you might have to take a warlock gate um from the lane you move to next because that residue that's on the ground whenever vexiona does her breath does not actually disappear until a little bit after her next breath so you will need to take some damage so again whenever you're baiting these you need to start either in the top lane or bottom lane then alternate between the two until the boss comes back down and then you can be in the middle the Void Ascendant in this intermission shouldn't really be DPS too much because you need it to be alive for two sets of adds in the second phase one. We typically DPSed it down to about 60 to 70%, but even that was kind of cutting it close and sometimes it died before it got its Annihilate off on the second wave of adds. So once you move back into the second phase one, uh, you just repeat what you did for the first one except that you're slowly moving further and further to the west side of the room and in this phase you will get three waves of adds from the portals the first wave will be shortly after this phase starts and this should be a fairly easy wave to deal with your void ascendant should be up so you have annihilation and the adds in it are not especially dangerous the only thing you need to keep an eye on is the sinister soul carver because that needs to be stunned whenever it teleports and starts casting spiteful assault the second wave of add is particularly dangerous if you don't cc quickly now if you have a blood death knight this is the one that should be mass script this wave contains three sinister soul carvers and they all start casting spiteful assault at the same time so if you let them cast for longer than two or three seconds then some people in the raid will most likely die to the damage so you need to either mass grip them as soon as they jump away to start casting or use some sort of hard cc on them stuns knocks anything along those lines will work after your second wave is dead the void ascendant should also be killed off and at this point you're just damaging the boss the third set of adds will spawn right before the intermission and again, the spawn point of this portal will determine which lane you will bait to first in the intermission. This wave will have two enforcers in it, and one of them will transform into a Void Ascendant. Just make sure this wave of adds gets DPS down fairly quickly, because there's a lot of issues that usually happen in this phase, with people getting gripped by the enforcer while they have the Encroaching Shadows debuff. The Void Ascendant in the second intermission phase should be damaged down to about 30% because it only needs to be alive for one set of adds and then after that set you should be pushing the boss to 40% and to phase 2. So the push time into phase 2 will depend on your raised DPS but you should be pushing the boss before you get the second wave of adds in the third phase 1. Typically, we just focus all of our damage into the boss after the second intermission just to make sure that we make that damage check. And then if there are any adds alive, we clean them up shortly before we push the boss. Phase 2 is mechanically fairly simple. It's more of a damage check and healing check. However, there are a few roles that are very key to this phase that need to be done. First of all, your tank should position the boss to shadow the line between top and middle and this will allow your melee dps to move between those two lanes without the tanks having to move the boss so they will simply rotate it either to their left or to their right depending on which lane the breath is coming in and the melee will rotate with this uh, so this makes it very easy and reduces a lot of movement from the fight your range dps will want to shadow the line between middle and bottom and they want to be kind of loosely spread in this phase, but still close to each other to not have the haste reduction debuff. One of the key roles that needs to be done on this fight is having a player call out which lane Shadow Vexiona is going to breathe on. As a tank, this is very hard to call out because you're near the wall, so your camera angle is all wrong. And whenever Vexiona is on the close side to you, you're most likely not going to be able to see her. So you need either a ranged DPS or a melee DPS keeping a constant eye on the Shadow Vexiona and instantly call out which lane she's going to as soon as she commits. Whenever the boss casts Heart of Darkness, the range should always try to be in the bottom lane because that is the furthest from the boss and the melee should just have a pre-placed marker that they all run to to reduce the damage they take from this ability. 
Generally, you will have a few people with encroaching shadows right as Heart of Darkness is going out. And these players need to be very careful to drop their puddles off while also dealing with Heart of Darkness without getting feared. Because getting feared in this phase it can mean death, especially when Heart of Darkness is shortly followed by a breath by Shadow Vexiona. The third and last important mechanic in this phase is Desolation. And you should only have to deal with two sets as long as your raised DPS is pretty good. If you make it to a third set, the boss should be dying right after it. So I wouldn't really set up a strategy for the third one. But the, for the first two, there's essentially two ways of dealing with them. You either want Desolations to go on your third tank and two melee DPS who are generally very tanky, such as Demon Hunters and Death Knights. Or you want your first Desolation to go on the entire melee stack and your second one to go on the range stack. Doing it this way will put a bigger strain on your healers, but especially at higher gear levels, this might be a better solution. Next for the damage section of this fight, this fight is kind of deceptive because there are a lot of adds on it. However, most of the adds will get killed by Annihilation, which means that you should be optimizing mostly for boss damage rather than cleave damage. There's only one or two waves of adds where you won't have Annihilate available to you to kill them. And most of these points, the boss will not be in the room so you can focus all of your damage into the adds without losing any boss damage. So I definitely recommend that most of your raid optimizes for single target, while a few people and a few classes who have very strong passive cleave will help with that add damage. Generally, the hardest part of this encounter is the sub 40% burn. And that is pure single target. So you want your entire raid to have a good single target setup. Also note that you will only get one use of two minute cooldowns in the last phase. So you need to be aware of that. And typically you want to use that with Bloodlust when the boss reaches 40%. So as far as dealing with the adds that spawn from Dark Gateway, there's a few things to keep in mind. First of all, the Void Bolt cast by the Spellbound Ritualist can be interrupted. It doesn't deal a terrible amount of damage, but if you have free kicks and you have a weak aura, just set it up quickly and get interrupts on it. Typically your third tank will do a lot of these interrupts, but range DPS can help out with this to reduce the damage taken by the raid. Second, the Iron World Enforcers are the adds with the highest health. So if you're a class who likes to cleave off of a high health target, then you should definitely be targeting the Iron Wield Enforcer because first of all, they cannot be CC'd and second of all, they do have the highest health, so they will typically die last. The Fanatical Cultists generally just get cleaved down. However, in the second intermission on the add wave that spawns right before it, you need to kind of focus a little bit of damage into them just to make sure that you don't have them transform into Void Ascendants during the intermission. Now we'll talk about healing Vexiona. For this fight, you're going to want to bring four healers. While this fight isn't too healing intensive, there's periods where you're going to want high throughput, particularly in phase two, as it ramps exceptionally hard in damage taken. One very important trait in healers on this fight is that they bring strong tank healing so that you can keep your tanks topped up during despair. One of the best aspects about Vexiona is that until phase two, the entirety of this fight is 100% scripted and timer based and therefore you can plan out raid cooldowns to happen at the same times every fight from pull to pull. With that said, let's talk about some of the mechanics of this fight. So for starters, roughly every 15 seconds, two targets will be debuffed with Encroaching Shadows, which will do AoE splash damage to anybody around them. We don't necessarily recommend spreading out to reduce the damage from the splash, but just be aware that it's going to do damage to your raid. One other note on this mechanic is that on Mythic difficulty, those targets who get debuffed will get a stack of Void Corruption when it times out, which is the Phase 2 Rot mechanic. Secondly, as mentioned earlier, one of the major healer mechanics is Despair. Vexion is going to debuff her target, which will be a tank, which will cause them to take damage over the course of that 6 second debuff. Additionally, once that debuff times out, the raid will take damage equal to 120% of the tank's missing health. Whilst the tank has this debuff, you should have raid frames glowing, hots rolling, and sirens blaring just to keep the tank at 100% health. Despair happens at specific timings every pull at the timestamp shown on screen. 
one other phase one mechanic for healers is that the tank who is tanking the ad will gain stacks of annihilation roughly four per second and you're going to want to rotate healer dispels on that tank so that their stacks don't get too high we chose to dispel roughly at six stacks in addition to these two mechanics, there's one other important phase one damage taken mechanic, which is Dark Gateway. When Vexiona spawns a portal that summons the adds, there is an explosion of raid-wide damage that happens. There's not much to mention here other than no, you're going to get chunked at those timings. And like Despair, this happens at specific times, shown on screen. So once you do push Vexion into phase two, your raid will continue to gain stacks of Void Corruption, which will act as a soft enrage as you will eventually be unable to heal through it. As such, you should be rotating throughput cooldowns, ideally using your stronger cooldowns towards the later end of the phase. As for damage reduction cooldowns, you should aim to have at least one for each Heart of Darkness. And you should really only have two Heart of Darknesses, so you can double up. These Heart of Darkness casts occur roughly every 30 seconds and do large proximity falloff raid damage. So as for niche healing advice on this fight, if you're a healer who doesn't have strong single target healing, i.e. a Disc Priest, you can opt to run Vitality Conduit as a major so that you can do large amounts of healing to the tanks during Despair. One other essence suggestion is that Mistweaver Monks may opt to run Way of the Crane as there are frequently a large number of adds to spinning Crane Kick on. Another tip is that Resto Shamans gain Tremor Totem value on this fight as Heart of Darkness will fear anybody who is not in proximity of an ally. Additionally, Resto Shamans are also valuable because they can spec into Windrush Totem, which is quite good for intermission movement. For tanks on Vexiona, you're going to want to bring three tanks, all with very specific jobs in Phase 1. These jobs can be done by any class, but classes with self-healing are generally a little better at boss tanking, um, while Brewmaster Monks are better at tanking the Void Ascendants. Your first tank is going to tank the boss the entire time. On pull, take Vexiona over towards the right and point her away from the raid. You shouldn't have to move from this position all of Phase 1. Rest will cause a decent amount of damage to you, but cooldowns and externals should be saved for despair. It will happen twice in each Phase 1, once about 11 seconds in, and then again 35 seconds later. And you will want to use everything in your arsenal to keep yourself topped, as any missing HP that you have will be dealt in a non-split AoE to your entire raid group. As the boss tank, you will also be responsible for picking up the sphere dropped by the Void Ascendants on death, and should use this to help nuke down the adds during intermission. However, the primary reason you should do this is because it drops your Void Corruption stacks that you've been gaining from tanking all the breaths. The best time to do this is after the first move during the intermission, as adds will be in a line trying to traverse the room. After you use this ability, there is nothing else to do until the boss comes back, other than help DPS down any remaining adds. The second tank is going to have full-time aggro on the Void Ascendant. As this tank, you will take less damage overall, but in a more spiky fashion. Position the Void Ascendant in cleave range of the boss, but facing away from the raid. If you find out that your raid is doing too much cleave damage and killing this ad prematurely, it can be tanked away from the boss for a bit, but make sure you yourself stay in range of healers. Annihilations will happen too frequently to cool down all of them, and it's likely the boss tank will need some of those externals to get through to spare. So you should sit on using your cooldowns until you feel it is absolutely necessary about a third of the way through an annihilation. You should not be expected to take an entire Annihilation without a Dispel, and should be getting Dispelled at least three times per cast so that the damage does not get out of hand. Since you control the direction of the Annihilation, you will be responsible for killing adds that spawn from Dark Gateways. Simply point the Annihilation at the pack of adds, specifically the Iron World Enforcer, so that they will take damage and gain stacks of Annihilation. During the Annihilation cast, know that the ad will not melee, so you can safely turn your character around if you need to line things up better, but this is not ideal, as it'll probably stop you from self-healing. Regardless of how you line up Annihilations, make sure to let the raid know what is happening. For example, if a portal spawns behind a range and you need to beam those adds, vocally let them know that they are going to have to move soon. During the intermission, you will always have a new Void Ascendant to pick up. This should be tanked on the opposite side from where your raid is dropping shadowy residue pools. 
when you need to change lanes to dodge Vexiona's Twilight Decimator, make sure to always take a path towards the outside of the raid, such that moving around the Ascendant puts it between you and the raid so that Annihilations during the intermission will not hit anyone. The third tank is responsible for picking up and holding aggro on the rest of the adds in the fight. The third tank needs to be sure to run at any portals that spawn and start instantly generating threat on these, then pull them as close as they can get to cleave range. The adds should never be tanked so close to the Void Ascendant tank that your second tank will not be able to get out of the Enforcer's AoE. Other than that, they can be positioned virtually anywhere around the boss. All tanks of any role in Phase 1 can help with add control, primarily in the form of using a stunner and knock to stop the spiteful assault. If your guild opts to use a two-tank solution, there is simply a boss tank and an add tank. The add tank is responsible for tanking the Ascendant's Annihilation and picking up every add that spawns out of a portal. To make your life a little easier with the strategy, you can move backwards away from the Ascendant during the Annihilation cast so that all of your adds will get inside of it. Alternatively, with enough damage, the Ascendant can be cleaved down before the adds even spawn, and all of the adds can just be tanked under the boss and will die to cleave. We recommend using the 3-tank strategy until you are certain that your raid has enough damage output to pull this off. In Phase 2, your Phase 1 rolls no longer matter. There should be one sphere down from a killed Void Ascendant, and you can do one of two things with this. One, if you spent a little bit of time in the last Phase 1, it can be used right away in a random direction just to clear your Void Corruption stacks, or you can save it until after the first Desolation cast when you will have significantly more stacks and use it to clear then. Either way, your first order of business is to get Vexiona out of the room and over towards the top corner on the side without shadowy residue. Vexiona should be positioned with her body on the top middle line such that both melee and tanks could be in either lane without having to move her. Leave enough space behind melee for pools to drop for a minute or two, so maybe about like 20 or 30 yards. But ideally, you do not want to move all the way towards the wall off the bat. Since the phase mechanic requires stacking, two tanks should try to stay stacked while the third tank can stay with melee. The two boss tanks can break apart for breaths, which will give them both the hasty buff, but only for a limited amount of time. This will prevent additional stacks from being applied to whichever tank is stacked, but does not have active threat of the boss. When running out for Heart of Darkness, the two tanks should always just run along the top mid line. This is due to the fact that as the fight goes on, some Twilight Decimators happen at the same time, and there needs to be a quick way to dodge it and still stay stacked. Since you are a little more tanky than DPS, you don't need to run out too far as you can handle the slightly higher damage hit. And since you only have one other person to stack with you, there is a high chance of error if both of you try to max range the Heart of Darkness. There's also a weird issue of her turning and breathing someone in melee if you've ran too far away. So it's just easier to stay a little closer to the boss. The last thing you are going to have to deal with in this phase is Desolation. It's a debuff that will always go on the active tank. Since this needs to hit at least three people, those three people should be the tank targeted, the third tank, and a tanky leechy melee. Most of the time, this is going to be a Havoc Demon Hunter. Each Desolation should go on these same three people, as this will keep a large amount of stacks off the raid. The only setback to doing this is that these people will maybe die after the second desolation and almost certainly die after the third just due to them having so many stacks. When soaking this, there is also a meteor damage component up front, so use a personal here if you are low from the ticking damage. As the active tank, if your other two tanks are dead at this point, call for a melee to come stack on you when breaths are not happening. Thank you so much for watching this video and if you enjoyed it please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more content and again a huge shout out to Lozi and Shampi for helping me out. If you want to check out their Twitch and Twitter you can find those in the description box.